psychedelics can be a shortcut to decades of meditation. And then I began thinking like, cool, what if you did this through smart contracts where like people could pull their money together and you could literally say, uh, once enough money is in there, a chemical manufacturer could come in, kind of claim it as a bounty and then deliver the substance and then, and then participants could, uh, could distribute that substance. I think the IP system is just as broken as the central banking system. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Ryan Crane, and I'm today joined, first of all, by Paul Kolhas. He's the co-founder and executive chairman of Molecule, also previous guest on this podcast. And uh, he, they've been incubating a lot of different initiatives around decentralized science, uh, you know, including one related to uh, psychedelics. And then we also have here the father of our most frequent guest, where we have Dima Buterin, uh, so the father of Vitalik, who's been a long-standing, very active member of the Ethereum community in many ways, and is also very interested and in deeply involved in sort of the transformative power of psychedelics, because that's going to be our, our topic today. So um, now, just before we get in, uh, I would like a few words from our sponsor this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at chorus.one. Cool. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining us today, guys. I mean, maybe let's just start with a little bit of background. Maybe Dima, do you want to go first? Tell us a bit like what's been uh, your journey and how did you end up here? You have to give me some more direction because otherwise, <laughs> you know, like okay. uh, what is really yeah. there, right? <laughs> like I was born, I grew up, uh, I suffered sometimes and right now i'm here talking to you guys and it's exciting and i love you know their ideas of decentralization and uh psychedelics as a fun topic as a powerful tool so excited to have this chat with you guys okay perfect i think that was a good uh, that was a good uh a good kind of intro and then uh, what about you paul uh maybe to relate it specifically to the context of the call uh so I was born as well, <laughs> oh, nice. and began, began growing I mean, up. Supposedly, <laughs> right? Or apparently. We have something in common. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was born as well, and then uh, growing up, I, I spent a lot of time uh, as a teenager in front of my computer, uh, as, as maybe some of us did, uh, playing World of Warcraft, uh, collecting interesting herbs. Um, uh, I, I was a shaman and a healer, actually, in World of Warcraft, so very early on, it was like... We found fun and interesting to combine things. Uh, and then I spent a lot of time in like online Reddit forums as a teenager. Uh, and many of these forums were uh, dedicated to different like um, biohacking topics, uh, nootropics, uh, but among others also uh, psychedelic research. 
So probably at the age of 15 or so, even though I hadn't done psychedelics yet, I was like on Arrowhead, uh, which some of you may be familiar with, which is like with one of the first um, kind of open science trip report platforms and on psychedelic research. Uh, so I spent a lot of times in these forums um, looking at different new emerging, uh, emerging, emerging substances. Uh, and then I think when I was 18, I took, uh, decided with a friend together to order a few of them online. So back then, a lot of like research chemicals were still pretty openly available in the, in the white web. These were all legal research substances at the time. Uh, a lot of it actually based on Alexander Shulgin's work. Uh, and as I began looking outside of the psychedelic research community as well, I realized, hey, there's communities here that are looking at developing their own HIV therapies because as HIV uh, patients, they don't have access to anything. Uh, that, that actually treats them were um, diabetic patients, for example, that were looking at developing their own insulin. And, uh, and so I found this really interesting. And I was like, I asked myself as a teenager, why are these people here? And I realized they're simply here, one, out of curiosity in the case of psychedelics, but also maybe because they're looking uh, for a psychedelic therapy and maybe um, psychedelics aren't available in their country or in their jurisdiction, which is why they're online with internet strangers trying to get access to something. But in other cases, it was often just out of sheer need, out of sheer necessity, because people couldn't afford insulin uh, or they couldn't afford a specific cancer treatment. So we're spending a lot of time online in online communities. Uh, and then so found that really fascinating and realized there as a teenager, hey, here's a fundamental disconnect between what people need, but then also the power of open source. And then I went to university, studied economics, and then during my studies, I learned about Bitcoin. Uh, this is about 2013. And, um, and started diving into like in internet forums again, but this time about like back then it was still our cryptocurrency and our Bitcoin and our Bitcoin markets, I think, uh, and realized, hey, there's a similar pro proliferation here of like open source ethos of, um, um, of open source building. And then began looking at open source uh, software. Um, I found that really interesting and noticed there's a lot of similarity here in terms of what I was experiencing in those early biohacking or um, psychedelic research forums and what I was experiencing in, in, um, in these online forums. Um, and that's a part of the thesis that later on led me to, uh, yeah, to believe in decentralized science and, and build what I did with Molecule. But maybe I felt like that was a long, that was a longer interest. So maybe I'll just give a pause here and hand it back to you, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. No, thanks so much. Yeah, maybe I feel like also should add, I mean, per so personally, I remember when I was like an undergrad, I somehow started reading about psychedelics and I was also super fascinated by it. And I think by the idea of like, okay, the mind being, you know, potentially being so different on it. I remember reading all of like Timothy Leary, somehow the guy with, I found very uh, inspiring. So he was one of these big uh, psychedelic leaders in the 60s and he was a very radical guy, right? He was very, I, I guess in many ways, a bit similar to some of the crypto philosophy in terms of really trying to kind of uh, yeah, it had I think big political agenda around it too, right? Because it felt it was like this vehicle for societal change, and uh, so I got very interested. And then, and then you know, l later years uh, also spent a decent amount of time uh, exploring exploring the mind, right? Which includes meditation, but also psychedelics and things like that. So I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, so dear, maybe maybe to make it more directly, also why why I reached out. So I've actually been looking forward to having a conversation with you for like a couple of years. I've always been really curious about um, specifically about your relationship with psychedelics. So I went to EdCon Toronto in 2018, uh, still like relatively early Ethereum days, and I was having a conversation with someone. Um, yeah, and I was having a conversation with someone about psychedelic research and and telling them about some of these early ideas I had around like how can we use smart contracts to essentially fund uh, fund or explore or proliferate psychedelic research. And he mentioned that I should really speak to you uh, because you had an in intimate um, intimate relationship with also more obscure psychedelics. And so I wanted to ask you, what is your personal relationship uh, with psychedelics through, throughout your life? They entered my life pretty late. If we speak about age, uh, I am about to get I will soon turn 52, so the very first time I tried psychedelics was when I was 42, 10 years ago. And my entry point, like, I always had a very curious mind and uh, always read a lot, and it was awesome in terms of learning. It was my preferred way of seeking, my preferred way of distracting myself from feeling and living, if you will. 
And uh, one particular book that I was reading at the time was uh, Waking Up by Sam Harris. And uh, really good book, loved it. And the book, the subtitle of the book is uh, uh, Spirituality Without Religion. Uh, and for me, that was very interesting to learn, to, take, to learn his perspective because growing up in the Soviet Union, I was, uh, my programming was that religion is uh, awful. It's all a sham, and uh, and uh, so growing up for me, religion, spirituality was one big bundle of bullshit. And uh, so this book gave me a slightly more, you know, fine distinction of those different types of uh, bullshit, if you will. But most interestingly, in this book, there was a chapter about psychedelics, right? And uh, the way he was talking about that was very eye-opening because I grew up again, like you know, my programming was like. Drugs are bad, you know, they fry your brain, never touched anything besides wine. Well, maybe a few years before psychedelics, I also uh, started, you know, opened up to uh, cannabis. Uh, so cannabis, I don't consider it psychedelic, but it's related, right? So anyways, so there was a chapter, and in this chapter, he basically said that uh, psychedelics can be a shortcut to decades of meditation, and that really picked my curiosity, be like, what, drugs? They're bad for you. Meditation is good for you. How does that work? And after reading this book, I uh, did a lot of reading and research and listened to, like, many dozens of podcasts, read and lots and lots of books, and eventually realized, yeah, I've been brainwashed, and uh, this is a very interesting tool for humans. And uh, eventually I tried my very first psychedelic, which was LSD, and since then, then there were many other experiences, and they were eye-opening, and they gave me very different perspective of uh, what humans are, what consciousness is, what God is, everything, right? And my personal story, and uh, if you will, the psychological trauma uh, eventually went away. So it was a really fascinating journey in the last 10 years. I'm curious, you said like your personal traumas went away. Is this something you can like expand on? Sure. And I mean, obviously any statements like this, again, they bullshit because uh, I, I don't even like the word trauma anymore, right? Because the way I look at this is different, you know, going to the forest and you will see all these different trees, right? And you look at this particular tree and you can see, oh, maybe this branch is broken. Maybe this branch is uh, dried up and, you know, lifeless. Is that trauma, right? Or is that a feature of this particular tree, right? And uh, the same with humans. We have our unique set of experiences and uh, they shape us as individuals, right? And the human mind tries to build a very simplistic story of this. Like, oh, here's, this is me, and this is my trauma, and if I get rid of my trauma, then I will be better authentic self, you know. It's such bullshit, but anyways, that's kind of the common story. Um, and uh, for me personally, for a big chunk of my life, there was a painful story that I'm not lovable, I'm very awkward, I'm very, whatever, physically unattractive, and uh, I'm not loved by others, and especially by females, and my trauma was kind of connected to my mom, uh, and at some point, that thing disappeared, and it was very fascinating, like, you know, all of those stories just went out of the window, and then it's like, oh, wow, here's the same reality, and I still have the memories, but those memories no longer, you know, combine into that story, and the story of pain, and the story of suffering, and poor me, and, uh, you know, blame, and no, it was just, like, it became very light. All of my past eventually became ephemeral, if you will. It's there, but it's no longer seen as uh, as real in any way, if you will. Just an abstract story. No, that's very beautiful. I really appreciate you describing sort of how the impact it had on you. And, you know, it's a, it's not like, again, it's not like you do this and then you become pure and clear and, you know, suffering free. It's bullshit. You're human. Stuff happens and, you know, you get sick. People around you get sick. Sometimes they die. Stuff happens. You make money, you lose money. Relationship happened. Like I recently uh, had a very painful breakup. Um, and 
it's been a lot of processing to go through that. And, uh, and it was fascinating to observe how different emotions go through this. And they're like, oh, I'm okay. That's, that's not a problem. You know, I'm above this. But then deep waves of sadness come and like, oh, oh, wow, this is fucking killing me. Uh, a new story comes up, right? And then eventually uh, I had a couple of uh, sessions with some helpful tools and uh, really breaking down into deep abandonment wound, like, you know, something pre-verbal. And there's no story, but there was so much crying and screaming and sobbing and wailing, uh, like uncontrollable, unstoppable. And, uh, and when the organism really gives into that, it stops being a problem. It's just like, wow, uh, extremely intense. And it becomes extremely peaceful and beautiful. And it's just amazing. It's like, how can that be, right? Like, you know, in normal life, we usually try to say, this is beautiful, this is ugly, this is positive, this is negative, right? But it's fascinating, right? Because life is not like that. You can go through the deepest devastating sorrow and at the same time, that's beautiful and loving and compassionate and peaceful at the same time and angry. Yeah. That's really beautiful, Dima. I, I, I had a, a um, um, first of all, very sorry to hear that you had to go through that experience recently. To, like break up, breakups are among the hardest things that I think we can experience as humans, um, both in romantic relationships, but even with, with friends. Uh, or, or partners uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. Um, I actually, uh, I was always really cu profoundly curious to try ayahuasca uh, in my life, and I've I've I've, I've done um, a couple of times now. Uh, and I think first something that I learned through actually working with shamans and doing um, ayahuasca in almost like a ritualist uh, retreat like setting is this big differentiation between like psychedelics as medicine and and psychedelics with a very clear intention and then also psychedelics as like tools and recreational tools expanding the mind expanding the consciousness taking something at a festival with friends or in whatever setting um so the first time i went to an ayahuasca retreat uh, i was coming out of a four four and a half year extremely difficult extremely difficult relationship and i was, i'd almost like hit rock bottom from a from a um emotional standpoint but also like my, my energy levels my karma uh and uh and so finally had felt that i had this calling to do an ayahuasca retreat and it was it was over new year's and i was just like i was looking up things to like online it was maybe like a month before i was originally wanting to do a vipassana retreat which is like this 10-day silent meditation uh, but they're really hard to get into you have to be extremely committed and normally sign up three or four months ahead and so I realized, okay, I'm not going to be able to do a Vipassana. So I'm, I'm looking up for like what other kind of retreat could I do over New Year's just to get myself into a better headspace. And this was almost at a point where like we, I was, I was um, coming out, out of this relationship about to, we were about to like move to separate continents and uh, I was also fundraising for, um, uh, for, for my second company. So extremely, extremely difficult time. And so I went and did this retreat and uh, actually the first ceremony or the first time I took ayahuasca, I felt... I just fell asleep <laughs> and uh, maybe to any listeners, uh, if you've never done ayahuasca, ayahuasca can be very different for different people. And it's something it's almost even from a chem biochemical composition. It's something that has to build up in your body. So ayahuasca is both composed of MA MAOIs and then of, of DMT and the MAOI has to get to a level where the DMT can actually flood your brain and, and cross the blood, blood brain barrier efficiently. So the second time I took it and my attention going into this retreat was really to like find peace or like find a way forward with this very difficult relationship uh and and kind of like liberate myself from it um and then it only took about 15 minutes at the second ceremony and 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 then throughout throughout the the journey so to speak with the medicine i i kind of relive all of the experiences of that relationship and i think when we are in relationships we often protect ourselves from the bad like we only especially in a breakup we only want to see the positive especially when the breakup happens to us as opposed to like as a mutual thing or like you're breaking up with someone, you only tend to want to see the positive the, and you, you attach yourself to it so strongly. How or great only the negative, was. right? Depending on, you know, circumstances, right? Sometimes you get stuck in the negative, sometimes just in the positive. Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely. Only, uh, oh, yeah, it, I think it goes both ways. I'm like an internal optimist by design. So like whenever like when I when in break up like situations, I attach myself to like why this was the best thing ever and then try to try to fix it and, and save it. Uh, and so uh, and so within the first 20 minutes of this of the trip, I kind of fell into this deep, um, the steep journey of reliving almost every moment of pain throughout the relationship and like why breaking up was the right thing. And then came out the other side, being able to envision my future life without this person in my life. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, yeah, I felt like to, to the earlier point that you made, I felt like I lived through years of like, I was able to close with one, just one of these sessions, like through years of trauma and actually come out where I felt a profound sense of gratitude for the relationship, but like very ready to go on this next, uh, this next stage of my life. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to share, can really relate to what you're saying. And also, uh, I, uh, I, I think there's an interesting diff separation or differentiation to make between like psychedelics as medicine and like, and the whole, um, going to ceremonies or going to retreats. And then also psychedelics, I think as ways to expand consciousness in a, in a recreational setting or, or at even, even as different medicinal tools. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing that as well, Paul. Yeah, I, I feel maybe I want to share. I, I, I feel for me, I think one of the things that I think I felt with like, I, I think for me, it was also like acid in the beginning when I was maybe like 21, 22 or something. But I think I had the experience of just feeling very sort of like stuck in my own like personality. Right? I felt like, man, yeah, just sort of like tra trapped in there. And I would, I would keep moving to different continent, different country because of to, to try to find like to try to sort of find myself in some new environment where nobody knew me. And and I feel like what psychedelics, I think we sort of did was just to open up or like, oh, this, the mind is so vast and so capable of like change as well. What do you guys think of the societal role that psychedelics maybe have today or also like could have in the future so i think if we actually dig back into like the 60s and 70s i mean when psychedelics first so actually no, I, I think it's interesting to look back even further i mean i think psychedelics have been integrated into like ancient societies and civilizations i mean there's many theories that like there's like a what is it the stoned ape theory that actually different um neanderthals and like prehistoric humans used to eat mushrooms regularly uh, then I think psychedelics had a strong role in like the Mayan uh, and Aztec empires. So like this kind of also the the um, the origins of ayahuasca. And then I think it was really around the the aftermath of the Second World War and the Cold War and like when LSD was discovered and different scientists were really actively looking at psilocybin again or peyote mushroom that actually the role of psychedelics massively changed to be viewed as something negative and, and bad. Because uh, I don't think people, and then there was this whole Vietnam Vietnam war, like you didn't want to, the, the powers that be didn't want the American public to wake up or realize that there's this fast, this, this much larger thing, I think that surrounds us. Uh, and I think probably around 2010-ish, I felt like, I feel like we've been slowly breaking out of that again, meaning that psychedelics today are um, much more acceptable acceptable again and that there's I think we're seeing like a research renaissance I actually think psychedelics within them if used in the right way you really have the power to to fundamentally cure things from to fundamentally cure specific um, mental diseases or problems like chronic depression I mean there's so much data emerging around that uh, and um, a the molecule um, so something that I've often, or like a phrase that often stuck with me, uh, which is, was from a, from a Goldman Sachs analysis of a large pharma company, they asked, is curing patients a sustainable business model? And in the context of this, they were analyzing uh, a drug, I think, developed by GlaxoSmithKline that was a hepatitis C uh, drug. And so hepatitis C previously didn't have any uh, cures, it only had a treatment. So if you get hep C, you have hepatitis C for life. And then... They had various treatments on the market. And so JSK developed this, this cure for hep C. It's like a six month pill that you take and then you don't have it anymore. And so Goldman was like, with like, this is bad. You shouldn't have developed that cure because you're hurting your bottom line by curing your, uh, like your, 
your recurring revenue. So like you're destroying your recurring revenue. Based on that, the company was downgraded. And I think like this, there's a CEO change or like, like there's a leadership change. And, and so the, the capitalist system that we live in today fundamentally disincentivizes cures, right? We're all about recurring revenue, recurring users. And I think this is one problem in the way that psychedelics are regarded because they, they act too much like a cure. They can be a cure for certain diseases, but they can also actually get people to move away from things like tobacco or, or um, alcohol or even cannabis. Uh, and so it's actually psychedelics aren't a very profitable business. And because of that, I think their role in society is still uh, is still very limited. And, and it's quite sad that that is the case. It's like, um, yeah, curious how that if that resonates with any of you. I mean, you know, you said capitalist system, but like, I don't know, is it capitalist system? Because it, it feels actually a little bit analogous to like, you know, the financial system where basically you have a bunch of like sort of incumbents that are using regulation to sort of, you know, control this market and control the incentives and, you know, keep things like crypto out, right? And be a viable alternative. And I think it's kind of like very similar, right? With the pharmaceutical company and the medical system and the medical insurance and all of that, just in, in this kind of like really bizarre. I mean, and then you have this like insane outcomes, right? Like in the US where you have, you know, insanely high healthcare costs that just seem to be going up and up and then life expectancy going down and the results being so much worse than in other countries and you have like you know medical debt there's this massive issue i think like number one cause of bankruptcy and stuff like that so i, I feel it's kind of and i remember actually one thing i watched some years ago so there's this documentary about i think it was like the first trial they did in the U uk uh, for giving, uh, I think it was psilocybin to people, like depressed people, right? I think Imperial did that college. And then they did the documentary about it where they followed the people in this trial, you know, before they did interviews and during and afterwards. And, you know, these were people who had been like depressed for like, 50, I think they had to be at least 10 years depressed. And then they had to have had, you know, a whole bunch of other types of treatments that all didn't work. And so they were really like, really bad shape right like a lot of them completely locked off and and then if you saw that uh documentary like the transformation that you saw in in a lot of these people was just incredible right it's like they came alive again and then it, but then it was also sort of a sad ending right because like you know for example i remember with one guy he sort of really came alive and you know the the children of this person were like oh for the first time it feels like I have a father again because he's actually kind of like here as opposed to before he just wouldn't talk even. Like he was just sort of there wandering around. And then he kind of came back and he was there for like two months, three months and like all of a sudden alive. And then he kind of gradually fell back again. And then, you know, it was sort of like the sad thing in the documentary. It was like, well, but you know, this is a trial and it's not legal. So like there's nothing we can do. And uh, I mean, I hope that will change and that this will actually become a viable alternative that people can, you know, can use to, I mean, one is, I guess, address their mental issues, but then, you know, maybe also just explore their mind and learn about themselves and reality and grow as people. And I want to throw in a slightly different perspective or maybe totally different perspective, right? Like stepping back a little bit, whenever we look at society, it's an abstract idea. Here's me, here's society. I know how it is. And I know that this is wrong and this is good. You know, and then from that, I come up with ideas that society would be better this way. End of the day, when you look very, very closely into this and become very obvious through meditation, through psychedelics, whatever, like, you know, we feel some emotions and some emotions are uncomfortable. And then we have ideas that if circumstances around us change, then we will feel better. And then we have an idea that when we feel better, that you know, circumstances change, this means that the world is better. And uh, it's very human and it's very dangerous. And I'll just throw a couple of examples at you, right? Like one is them as drug war, because yeah, some people are very scared and like, Drugs are bad, people are dying from them. Pe people dying is obviously bad, and they're drying 
from drugs, blah, blah, blah. And there is the societal change that we deem to be negative. So we will solve this problem. We will fight drugs. And look at all the mess. Look at all the money lost. Look at all the humans who suffered. Look at all the people incarcerated, right? So all, always our simplistic solution coming from the perspective, like, this is bad. There is an inherent danger, right? And the second small example is... Uh, uh, I grew up in the Soviet Union and the whole history of the Soviet Union, you know, like, oh, you know, this whole Tsarist empire was bad and now we will just like uh, take over and uh, build this socialistic system. And you know what? That system was absolute and total crap. Like, you know, absolute poverty, corruption, um, very inhuman and uh, lots, I mean, lots of good stuff, uh, lots and lots of bad stuff, right? So... For me, it's always like generalizing is very dangerous and then thinking that what I think is right is very, very dangerous, right? So I think the, the journey for each one of us is always, it's a journey about how I feel, right? How I feel and then here based on the emotions that we feel, then we have a range of options. And when we look at psychedelics, they are a very, very powerful tool that can affect the human psyche, right? And uh, what does that mean for a particular human? It might mean nothing. It might mean that they there is less suffering in them. It might mean that they go crazy or die. Like all kinds of outcomes, right? It's not like it's not a silver bullet. Like wow, we give people psychedelics to become better. Society will change, right? But here's the thing: uh, there are conflicting human drives in all of us, many of them, right? And one of them, for example, is that we want stability we want things to be the same right because they seem to be safer when there is no change and we try to find a way like okay you know what let's all follow these rules let's be this way and in this way we will be safe it will be okay right of course life doesn't work this way like you know look at all these attempts look at some of the religions that try to stick to those fundamentalist ideas like all this leads to disaster right the world is moving forward right and uh, it's inevitable and right now i think that we're going to face even faster rate of change uh, with AI and crypto and everything else, right? So their question is, how do humans deal with change, right? That's a fundamental question. And psychedelics is a tool that on the one hand it can be very scary because it can disrupt your safe and normal functioning. It's a tool can, that can help you adapt to change environment, right? But again, like, you know, it's not like nothing is black and white, right? So we kind of have to, whenever we look at situation, again, when we think, oh, I think that it would be better this way, it's always a very dangerous notion because things the way they are because of everything, right? Like, you know, it's not like uh, they are this way because the cabal of alien lizards is directing the earth to be bad in this way. Of course not. It's like, you know... It's the infinity of different things, you know, what's happening with the sun, with the weather, with humans, with food, with, you know, well, you know, different countries and so on, right? And all of that results in the current environment, right? So then we might have an idea and we want to, we act, right? And, you know, our action will have consequences and those consequences will be uh, always eternal and unlimited, right? And I look at, let's, again, Little example, Ethereum, amazing invention, amazing technology that brought out so much potential for humanity to better collaborate, cooperate, and so on, and has unleashed uh, so much uh, gambling. There ICOs originally, then you know meme coins and whatnot, and lots of people who made money, lots of people who lost tons of money, people who killed him themselves, right? So you can look at Ethereum and say, take a family and somebody in their family lost all of their money and killed themselves, right? So they might as well look at the theorem and say, oh, it's because of this horrible invention of Ethereum that my son or my husband or whatever, they killed themselves. So of course the theorem is bad, right? Because we are projecting our internal perspective. So this is always the danger. So anyways, that was my long speech to contribute to your guys' reflections. I, I think that was an incredibly interesting perspective, Dima. And it actually, it actually made me think, I mean, I think permissionless networks like Ethereum have a similar 
level of permissionlessness as psychedelics do when they enter the human body. It's like, it can be good, it can be bad. It always depends on your internal perspective. Um, I actually remember in the really early days of Ethereum, uh, this is like 2016, uh, one of the big concerns around open permissionless smart contract networks like Ethereum, there's a huge concern that like someone might post, for example, an assassination contract where like you could be paid a bounty if you assassinated someone and and like people were really scared about this as a use case. I remember specifically like the Bitcoin cast being like, you can't enable this open permissionlessness with smart contracts. Like, uh, and, and then it's funny enough to that it never actually happened. But uh, or like, like, of course, bad things happen on chain over time. Um, but yeah, maybe a, a follow up question. Do you, do you think so? I think we can look at the uh, the subjective effects of, of uh, of psychedelics, obviously in the human body, and like every everyone's experience is different, uh, and and you need to carefully weigh the pros and cons, as you should carefully weigh the pros and cons of engaging with any any smart contract on a network. Um, do you think access to psychedelics itself should be permissionless? Because today we can kind of consider it permissioned, right? In certain countries, it's completely forbidden, uh, like kind of yeah like there's a, a firewall almost on access to psychedelics in other countries there's a much larger access do you think access to psychedelics should be more permissionless awesome question right and um i can i can never give you one answer to anything i have to give you a whole bunch of answers like the first one i will tell you is that i don't believe in the concept of should right because uh the way things are, right, you know, you look at societies and there are obviously lots of people who are concerned and scared, right? And then you say, no, 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 it's good. You know, fuck your concerns, fuck your fears. We will, you know, make psychedelics available to everybody, right? So then you think that you're meaning well, right? But you also are disregarding the emotions of some humans around that, right? So, so for me, it's not about like, there's no objective shoot or whatever. I can only tell how it feels to me. I can tell I can tell you that in Toronto, for example, we now have a few dozen mushroom shops, and I think it's amazing. I think it's awesome that now people who want to have access to to, to these powerful tools, they can have access to this, right? I can also tell you that for me personally is uh, the whole idea that we tell people what is good and what is bad is uh, is very questionable, right? So I think that uh, for me inherently. Every human has the right to decide what is good and what is bad for them. Uh, and of course, it's like, again, it's not black and white. What, so if they decide, like Putin, that it's good for Putin and for Russia to go and invade Ukraine and kill people in Ukraine. So here's their, I mean, my perspective, right? It's like, I think it's his right to feel that way and to act that way. And then it's my right to, you know, feel differently and act in the opposite way and support Ukraine and, you know, and, and so on, right? So it's it's not like, you know, this is right and this is wrong, but this is like, here's that human's perspective, here's my perspective. So from my personal perspective, I think these are powerful tools. I, I would like to see them more available to humans uh, everywhere, uh, as well as uh, uh, people when they become decriminalized, right? It becomes much safer in terms of dosage, in terms of, you know, uh, 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 how pure they are in terms of uh, available support, uh, in terms of uh, normalization of everything, right? Because it's very interesting, like, and actually, and I want to comment on the concept of normalization, right? Because very often when I talk to humans who are going through some deep suffering, like, let's say I have a friend, awesome guy, very creative, and sometimes who is suicidal, right? And uh, sometimes when he's feeling that, he reaches out, right? And and I know that when I'm suffering quite often, then other people, they want to help. And they're like, well, Tim, I don't feel this way. Don't be sad and all that. Like, guys, what the fuck? I am sad. Why deny that, right? So when I talk to my friend, I don't tell him, oh, you should not feel suicidal. It's more like, oh, wow, you're feeling that, right? And uh, this is the reality. And it's very difficult and it's intense. And this is the stuff that happens to humans, right? Like, you know, so it's not about like saying that it should not be this way. It's about acknowledging that this is how things are, right? Because like when there is a, that's a better, that's the best foundation than for going anywhere is to clear, is to clearly see that things are 
the way they are, right? And they, they are the way they are for many reasons. Some of them we might be able to sense, some of many, most of them we're not able to see, right? So that's how I think about it. Paul, you mentioned, uh, like, I think there's some, uh, some involvement in uh, psychedelics and the birth of molecule. Can you talk about that? Uh, oh, um, uh, yeah. Oh, that, actually, this brings us back to the to the conversation that we, or like, kind of, um, just my personal introduction. So when I was eighteen, me and a friend uh, ordered a few um, psychedelic research chemicals online. Uh, if any of your listeners are more into that, there was four H O M E T, four A C O D M T, and a compound called two C E. Uh, and me and my friend, we dabbled a little bit, but then I kind of just kept these, uh, and it was a very small amount, and I just kind of kept them in my house for many years. And then um, after I finished university uh, uh, and was already kind of working in crypto, so this was like 2016, no, 2017, actually, late 2017, uh, I was working at Consensus um, and spent a lot of time in those past couple of months like, like looking at architectures of novel protocols that were emerging uh, one of them was actually uh, Ocean Protocol, for instance, but this is also the time that CryptoKitties kind of blew up on chain. And and, um, and so it was a really interesting new time, I think, on Ethereum. Like, And uh, I went home. Uh, I was at home. I think my, my, my parents are I was visiting kind of my, my, my hometown, uh, which is in Switzerland. Um, and... Uh, it, was listening to classical music, uh, or like Brian, Brian Eno and classical music, uh, and um, uh, was on a doing a two CE trip, uh, like a relatively small amount. But and during that trip, at towards the three or four hours in, I developed such a profound um, appreciation for having come into the into the ownership of this like very rare weird psychedelic, and I I kind of like. And if you know, so there's a whole 2CB range or 2C range, um, and these are all phenethylamines and and are structurally very similar to peyote or or mescaline. Uh, and so Alexander Shulgin was a famous chemist in the 70s and 80s. He's the inventor of MDMA, but he invented hundreds of other compounds. Uh, he was actually at a he was working at a pharmaceutical company when he developed MDMA, and then had such a like thought this was an absolute breakthrough. Uh, uh, but the company actually let him go because they're like, this is too weird for us, you're too kooky. And so he retreated and with his wife and Shulgin together, they built up um, a kind of a clandestine laboratory where they began kind of just discovering hundreds of new compounds. He, he published two books. One is called Pical, uh, Phenethylamines I've Known and Loved, and now this called Tical, which focuses on tryptamines. Uh, and... So out of this, there's this 2C range now, which is similar to mescaline, but some of them are very weird. They might work for like 20 or 30 hours. Like it's very much not, these are not like commonly known psychedelics. And so I, I do this trip at 2C and I, during my, it's actually the first psychedelic I ever took in my life. <laughs> Me and my friend, uh, and, and back then developed such a profound level of respect for this particular substance, because it's like, I think when you re read trip reports on Arrowhead, it says like, like really only for experienced psychonauts only because it's something that is extremely visually intense, but then also very neutral. So like, um, and with neutral, I mean that most, many psychedelic compounds have like, make you very emotional. It's like you go, you, you LSD for me typically comes in like almost like waves. You go through different waves of intensity of emotion while you go through a trip. And so 2C specifically is extremely neutral to the point where you can almost look at yourself and like from like a third party and analyze your emotions in a very clinical way while you're while you're going through a trip. And so I'm on this trip. It's like eleven in the evening. I'm listening to music and uh, I think I was having a glass of red wine as well. And I just come to this point where I was thinking about my life. I just worked through some things, and I come to this point where I like have this profound appreciation that I somewhat through the internet got like. In, in the ownership of this the super rare substance and still had some of it and i was just like wow the internet is such an amazing place and then i was like wait what if instead of what if you began looking at this from a smart contract perspective and so i knew i'd spend a lot of time in these online communities and i i um these online communities often so if someone develops a new psychedelic substance it's actually very difficult to get it uh and if you develop a new substance in principle it's always legal 
because it hasn't been described in any uh, kind of in any yeah in any literature yet. But like it's just a new substance. Uh, and what online communities then typically do is they do something that is called a group buy. So like maybe Brian, you've read a new research paper from a university, and and you say, hey guys, I found this new thing. We should try this out. Who's interested? And then let's pool our money together. And then maybe we can do a group buy because typically doing a, a custom synthesis of a novel chemical compound is really expensive. It typically costs a hundred, maybe half a million dollars to just get get it produced. And um, and then I began thinking like, cool, what if you did this through smart contracts where like people could pull their money together and you could literally say uh, once enough money is in there, a chemical manufacturer could come in and kind of claim it as a bounty and then deliver the substance and then and then participants could uh, could distribute that substance, um, and that was that like that was kind of the origin of molecule. Um, I later on began realizing how that how that is actually related to IP. How you you need to move IP on chain. How IP is actually related to supply chains and distribution. Um, but yeah, kind of that night, and like it came into me like a lightning spark, and then I I started writing it down. And then I've essentially been building this organization ever since. But that's like the origin, that's the origin story. And I think it speaks to the absolute power that psychedelics have, I think, in infusing ideas, in infusing us with, uh, in infusing me with energy and in infusing, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to take Dima, uh, Dima's um, philosophy here of what they do to me specifically. So it really infuses me with ideas, with energy, with resolution. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's been an incredible journey of exploring how um, how I then ex extrapolate this to research more generally, how we can actually open up research in the same way that smart contracts have opened up um, the transfer of money, the transfer of ownership. I want to I want to ask uh, maybe going a little bit different one. So you said it's important to for IP to be like on chain. Why is that important? Uh, in interesting question. I think it's it's really asking why should money be on chain? Like why should it actually be on chain? Like you, we've got the fiat currency system; it kind of works. You know, I can make my payments, and I I think the IP system is just as broken as the central banking system. Uh, it, it's just it's it doesn't affect the transfer of wealth, or it it just actually affects the transfer of innovation and and how we transact or fund or disseminate research openly to the public. Uh, for humanity. And so the, the patent system was actually developed in the 18th century. And it had a lot of that a lot to do actually with like the um, still the history of colonialism. So the patent system is deeply linked together with colonialism and monopolization. Uh, the patent system had one big hard fork in the 1950s. But since then, the patent system has never really evolved again. And it's the fundamental thing that we use to to, um, to, yeah, to, to, to transact innovation in. Um, patents are generally created to incentivize innovation. So like if I'm researching, for example, a new treatment or a new, yeah, a new med medical treatment, I should be able to get back the money that I've invested into funding that, that cure or that treatment. What the patent system does though in reality is it dis really disincentivizes collaboration. It's often used for price gouging and it just creates monopolies. It creates these big pharmaceutical companies that we know as patent monopolies today that fundamentally control what comes onto the market. And so I said earlier, like uh, curing patients is not a sustainable business model. Um, there's many cases, um, both anecdotal, but also described in literature where, uh, where uh, larger companies specifically um, suppress innovation that might hurt their bottom line. Meaning that if I, have a, if I have a cancer treatment on the market and someone has a cancer cure, it might actually make sense for me to buy that and then just kill it and make sure it never sees the light of day. And with patents, you can actually do that. Uh, so the patent system, I think, that we have today is really disincentivizes innovation for humanity. And in a, in a similar way that I think the, the, the f central banking system today um, disincentivizes growth and the distribution of prosperity to humanity. It actually centralizes wealth uh, within, within a few, as we've seen with the central banking policies of the last eight to 10 years, specifically of the last four years. Again, if you look at what inflation has done in terms of concentrating wealth. Yeah. And so why is it important to take IP on chain? So we fundamentally believe that like permissionless open IP uh, that is programmable, um, where you can actually access the underlying data in an open fashion would make research and science unstoppable. 
meaning that in the current system, it might not make sense for a group of companies that are kind of collaborating in a cabal uh, to, to bring a drug to market. If, it, if the same drug or cure was um, published on an open network, capital would naturally allocate towards that. If it's like, if you looked at on the open network and you're like, okay, we have these five treatments, but there's one cure, we should all probably fund the cure. That makes the most rational sense. So I think in the same way that smart contracts are unstoppable, I think IP should become unstoppable. Scientific research should become unstoppable. I don't know if that analogy, did that analogy make sense? I think so. And I just wanted to like, you know, one little tiny thing, you know, what uh, what Paul was saying that resonates a lot, right? And I, uh, I do think that, you know, having more things on the public blockchain, the transparency of that, the decentralized nature of that is... Uh, resonates with me a lot, but uh, anyways, like one little thing that he said at some point, he said about rational decision. So here's the, my take. Uh, I don't believe there are rational decisions. No such thing. Humans are not rational. Their idea in the human mind, oh, here's me and, you know, I took this, you know, options, I consider them rationally and I made a rational decision. That's an idea, right? But why were the options the options that there were. Why was a particular option chosen? There's nothing rational about it. It's absolutely, totally subjective to a particular human existing in a particular context with all of their programming and brainwashing and patterns and the current desires and, you know, like, and did they see a lot of smiling people today? What did they eat yesterday? How did they sleep? How was the air? And, and so on, right? So, so anyway, it's like... Uh, um, that's kind of small, but important point that nothing in the world is rational. Do you, maybe a follow-up question on that. Do you think uh, if, and I, I tend to agree, uh, uh, to a lot of extent, I actually, I studied economics. So I think some of my, my thinking always veers into like the direction of rational markets. Um, do you think there's rationality on chain in an objective way? Do you think on chain people behave in a certain rational pattern? No. No, no. Okay. I look at humans and humans just like, uh, like yesterday, uh, a guy that I know, and he reached out to me about Vitalik's recent article about uh, uh, fully homomorphic encryption. You know, he reposted his old article and the guy is asking me, he is a smart guy. He's an engineer. He's asking me, oh, Vitalik mentioned FHE. Is that a coin? Can I buy it? Right. Okay. <laughs> you know, that's, that's human for you. Right. You know, and uh, I'll go in further. Right. Because. As humans, we constantly um, confuse our model of the world with the actual world. So the actual world is unknowable. The model of the world is is the model of the world, right? And it's like even like the basic things like uh, math. One plus one equals two. What does that mean, right? You know, there are no two objects in the universe. I mean, there are no objects in the universe. That's a separate conversation. But there are no two identical objects in the universe. You take two apples and, you know, one apple and one apple and one might be poisoned, one might, one might have worms or whatever. You take two electrons, they have different spin and different blah, blah, blah. And and what does it mean one plus one? You know, maybe they combine and blow up the whole city, you know, because of their fission, fusion, whatever, nuclear uh, blast. So, so, yeah, we as humans, we... Most of the time, we live in this abstract, you know, world of rationality and concepts and models, and we can, you know, and that's part of the reality. But we kind of think that this is their reality, but it's it's an aspect of reality. Uh, we spoke about Ethereum quite a lot. Do you, do you feel like psychedelics have anything to do with like the early origins of Ethereum? And I just um, a community member inside out he posted a tweet which is from Niraj K. Agarwal, which is like just uh, a troll, like a, like a, a well-known crypto Twitter troll. Uh, and he tweeted in 2017 that that he says, pretty sure the official drink of Ethereum is Soylent mixed with ayahuasca. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you have any opinion or like any experiences or knowledge that you would share, like lore that you would like to share about like the early history of Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum Foundation or... In your data products and psychedelics. <laughs> it, it's fascinating, right? It's like uh, human mind wants to find the cause and effect, right? 
And for me, it's absolutely clear that causality is a bullshit story because you can create many different causality stories. They all depend on the perspective. But uh, specifically to your question, how do you answer that? Like, you know, the original idea of Ethereum came up in Vitalik, right? Vitalik wrote their original white paper. And Vitalik had no idea about psychedelics, had no exposure, no experience with them. Uh, his white paper was based on his interaction with a lot of people around the world, right? And some of those people had experience with psychedelics and all kinds of other things, right? So that was part of their input into that, into the white paper of Ethereum, right? And then their actual realization of their idea of Ethereum from the white paper, that took lots and lots of amazing people to actually execute on that and build on that and make lots of mistakes and whatnot. And there were many amazing people. And I don't know, like, let's take Vlad Zamfir, smart, talented guy. And he was part of, a big part of uh, some of the early contributions to ideas on Ethereum. And then Vlad is really into, was, uh, as, as far as I know, deeply into psychedelics. And so, so they are there, but everything else. There are also cats around people, right? And there were birds and they were drinking <laughs> tea, right? Was it drinking of tea that made the impact in creation of Ethereum, right? It's all a bullshit human story, but that's all that we have, right? So do you want psychedelics to be important in that creation? Sure. Why the fuck not? <laughs> Cats were important for sure. I can guarantee you that, right? <laughs> and many other things like, you know, podcast, iPod. Uh, Vitalik heard about Bitcoin. For me, I've heard about Bitcoin on the podcast uh from what's his name i forgot the name of this guy but he's been running this security podcast so it was a security podcast called security now um and it's been oh, running yeah, for yeah. almost a couple of decades too. yeah you know like you know and why did i listen to that and it, it's all connected right yeah it's all one big quantum soup and then you want to like you know oh here's my causality story i will take this quantum soup and then I will start here, and then I'll go there, there, there. Oh, wow, that's a nice story. This is how this thing happened, right? Oh, but, and now, no, 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 you're wrong. You know, I'll start there and go there and like blah, 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 right? And, you know, here's another story, right? And now we're arguing which story is right, right? And I'm saying all of them and none of them and everything. I want to ask you, Paul, so Psydao, because, yeah, because you guys have sort of incubated different types of DAOs, you know, so like the ones I'm aware of, right, is like Vita DAO, which is a folk song longevity. And uh, and there is Hair DAO, right? I think it's focused on like hair. And then uh, and then I know I'm aware of Athena DAO, it's like focused on like reproductive health, women's health. Uh, and I don't know, there may be some others that I, I'm not aware of, right? But then there's also uh, Saida, which is focused on psychedelics. Like, what, what does Saida do? Saida's mission is to kind of like make psychedelic research and psychedelics by uh, definition themselves, like open and unmonopolizable. Uh, so applying like open science principles into, into psychedelic research. And psychedelics themselves have been... Yeah, I think we talked about this earlier, even from a research and academic perspective, quite tabooed. Uh, and even in online forums, uh, I think there are many online forums, for example, where most people post anonymously. There's still like this large stigma surrounding it. Um, and actually, maybe before we... And so one of the core things that Sada aims to do is fund open psychedelic research. Uh, there are many really underfunded areas, underfunded like that could be facilitated and do so in a community centric way that is on chain native. Um, Sada also supports um, psychedelic art, for instance, from the Shipibo Kinibo people, which is like a tribe in the Amazon that administers ayahuasca and create uh, sheep music, uh, which is really, and so trying to build an intersection between psychedelic science, uh, permissionless innovation, and psychedelic art, um, and weave that into like an on chain uh, tapestry. Oh, and then just because you said quantum soup, Dima, we actually have a DAO uh, also entering kind of this 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 flurry of innovation that is focused on quantum biology. So they're building, a, it's a research team, the world's preeminent uh, quantum biology researcher, and they're looking at how do we actually look exactly what is happening in that quantum soup, but from a biological perspective, because there's this big theory that quantum mechanics are actually at play in the cell, and it's the only reason that cells, uh, biological cells actually work is due to, due to quantum, quantum mechanics. Um, but one of the core things that Sida, um, sorry, like weird, weird side, 
we had Sidow Kevin. One of the core things that Sidow aims to do is build uh, one community member has called it like a tornado cast for trip reports. Um, because there's this huge stigma actually about how we collect psychedelic research. And like, for example, I probably wouldn't want to post a trip report that I had about, because it could be associated with me. I can get doxxed. And so Sidow is really exploring like how should psychedelic subjective data. Uh, so Dima, I also think you said that really well. I think psychedelic experiences are extremely subjective and we try to find causality. But I do think the more data you collect on something, the more causality you can infer over the effects of a particular substance or even of a, even about consciousness itself. Um, and uh, so what Sada is trying to build at its core is an open an open science platform that's kind of that is zero knowledge proof protected, uh, where both academic researchers, clinic, um, clinical researchers, can upload uh, data through study participants. So this is now, uh, Brian, you mentioned uh, a study that you'd read or uh, about a psilocybin trial. So this could now be actually used in the concept of um, psilocybin trials. To that extent, um, uh, Sada is working with Robin Card Harris uh, from Imperial College, which, who's a super well-known psychedelic researcher, and then um, a researcher called Bala Sigeti, who works really closely with him. He's now at UCSF. And uh, so we're building up this platform called Upsci, which is should be both for academic researchers, um, but also for anon psychonauts. Uh, and this then goes much more into like how can we create the arrow like um, a future arrow with. Um, and then if you want to take that further, you could then actually build you could train a crowd owned LLM based on that data that is emerging, uh, and use that to uh, to analyze the data. Um, to uh, to train an AI model that is community owned and community first, uh, that you can now ask questions, maybe from your own perspective, from your own causality of how other people are having similar experiences. Can I take this substance and combine it with this one? Has anyone done this? And do so in a in a safe uh, and uh, accessible way that yeah that opens opens this up to humanity. I think that could be both used both. So I often find myself googling, has anyone had a similar experiences with this this or this? And I think actually collecting all that data, bringing it together, and then also enabling a way for people to safely share uh, their psychedelic experiences uh, could be really valuable to, to humanity. I'm saying could be, <laughs> not should be, because it's obviously my, my, own, yeah, my own heuristic. And uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things that came up in me as you were sharing this. Uh, sounds like a pretty awesome idea. And I think that uh, it's very interesting because... Uh, every psychedelic experience right it's facilitated by this medicine right but it's very much dependent on your context on your consciousness on your emotional state on you know things around you and so on right so i think it's uh when we trying to research this kind of thing we cannot just say oh if me human add this molecule how do I predict what's going to happen when I put this molecule into this organism, right? The thing is like your organism, your consciousness is absolutely fucking unique. So the question is, how can you then, if you will make it more scientific by having a deeper understanding of what are their, what's the emotional setup of this organism, right? Like, how do you do that? And there are all kinds of psychological tests and all kinds of things. So this is a very important aspect of this. And the second one also, what is the physical state of this organism, right? So what kind of like, you know, and I hope that thanks to AI and many other tools, we will also have better, better access to individualized picture and understanding of this organism. Like, you know, my blood markers, my, you know, uh, uh, saliva, my, uh, you know, peptides, my gut bacteria and so on, right? Because like the, otherwise it becomes like, you know, we can have a really awesome idea about a particular molecule and then give it to two different people. And one person has an amazing experience and, you know, meets God and the other person goes crazy. Absolutely. What do you guys, do you guys feel like, I mean, at, at the, this time, right, there's also a lot of interest around this concept of like, you know, network states. Well, basically sort of like new types of, you know, communities, bodies that where people like, gather together, you know, create some kind of governance structure, maybe have some physical land and, you know, basically try to kind of reinvent like what we've had with nation states where there's been basically, you know, almost no innovation, right? For a long time, like you know, it's basically impossible to come in and say, Hey, I'm going to create a new, a new state and I'm going to do it with totally different rules. 
So I'm wondering, do you guys feel like there's a big intersection there and that that could kind of also be one of the ways where, you know, maybe psych psychedelics could end up having a completely different role in society? Let me start with this, right? I think on the one hand, it's a very natural uh, aspect of human evolution because uh, thanks to all the technologies that we have, it's so much easier now for, I've never met Paul, I've never met you, Brian. Actually, you look familiar. With, I think we've met at some conference, but uh, <laughs> <Midas>. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. But you know, we're connected and we're talking about. We have shared interest and we feel more connected, right? And and I look at my daughter and she's in this gaming community with Minecraft and she's into you know watching anime and she's connecting with a lot of humans. She doesn't have well, she. She's very smart and has her own unique you know uh, aspects and she doesn't have. Uh, friends around her here, but she's connected with people around the world, right? And I saw that in Vitalik, when Vitalik was growing up, you know, and then he became part of Bitcoin community way before he even met somebody in person, right? But by connecting online and so on. So I think that technologists, they do facilitate this creation of new connections and new kinds of communities in a totally new ways. That's for sure, right? But then I also want to point to this, like, uh, Again, the fallacy of uh, the human mind tries to idealize that and like, oh, wow, I can find all the people that like the same thing that I like, let's say Web3 or psychedelics, whatever, and we will create new community. It will be so awesome and I will be so happy. Well, you know what? That community will also will be full of all kinds of people. There will be some greedy assholes that will fuck you up and there will be some awesome people who will at some point will go crazy and you will meet the love of your life and then you will lose like you know like the humanity of us is not going away right so yes new tools new types of communities and uh this is uh, i see this as a natural evolution of uh, human society and also of us as human humans constantly experimenting with stuff right that's what we do like oh look at this mushroom let me eat it oh i'm dead oh no i am not <laughs> you know it's exciting right <laughs> so let's build this new community so it's amazing to look at all this uh experiments and look at Zalu, looks like a really cool experiment look at the theorem community and all the DAOs and you know like uh, meme coins right like you know the community is built around that stuff and uh, doesn't resonate with me but who cares you know there are lots of people who are excited and they connect and they resonate and they try to make money and they lose money and uh, maybe they lose money but maybe they find the, the love of their life right and so on so that's my take. What do you think, Paul? I would always lose all my money for the love of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think love is the ultimate trump card. If you, I think you can be, you can have lo lots of love and be really poor, but like, like ultimately, like no amount of money can get you love. Um, uh, but I, I think on a more on a more jurisdictional level, um, I also think network state experiments are really interesting and. I think actually, I think there's a similar, maybe forget about network states for uh, for a second. I think network states are really interesting because they enable a form of regulatory arbitrage that we haven't seen before or regulatory openness that we haven't experienced before. Um, and there's a lot of regulatory arbitrage in crypto, meaning that some people only live in Switzerland or in Dubai or in Singapore because it's where crypto can be freely traded, transacted, or you can actually own it. In other countries, for many years, you used to you couldn't even get a bank account if you were uh, like if you wanted to get any kind of crypto assets out. And the same is true with psychedelics, meaning that in Canada, for instance, I think I believe five MEO DMT is legalized. Uh, then you have Colorado, where I think mushrooms are now legalized, uh, and lots of people go to Peru because you can take ayahuasca there. Amsterdam had a similar role to play in the past with truffles. Um, and so there's all of this. I think that in crypto, you have a lot of regulatory arbitrage in terms of what you can do. With psychedelics, you also have a lot of regulatory arbitrage with what you can do. And so enter the network state. I actually believe one of the really strong roles of network states can be like really clearly defining, like we are open to this arbitrage. Or like we, we actually enable you to safely conduct, uh, well, we empower you to safely conduct um, crypto transactions. We empower you to safely conduct psychedelic research or, or, or safely take psychedelics. Uh, and I, I think this would actually be expanded to more and more things. I know uh, another network state, Vitalia, recently had a lot of, uh, or actually in Zuzal, both Vitalia and Zuzal had a big focus on long longevity as well. And in longevity research, you have a similar problem, meaning that 
for example, there are really interesting longevity gene therapies. Uh, however, even administering a gene therapy or running a trial for gene therapy in the United States is highly regulated. So uh, I think they have this little regulatory arbitrage where in Roatan, now um, a company called MiniCircle administers this new gene therapy. It's a follistatin therapy. Uh, and uh, initial results, just I, I met someone at a conference in Dubai that had actually taken this this therapy. There's only been 300 people globally. Uh, he'd taken the therapy and he was like, it's been absolutely life-changing. And uh, I, th I think he suffered, uh, he, he had medical issues before, but he didn't take the therapy specifically for that. He's just like this longevity crack. Um, and uh, he spoke extremely highly about this therapy and said it was like life-changing for him. He's in his early 30s. So it's not like that he's that old yet. And uh, again, this really has to do with regulatory arbitrage. And, and so I think network states can play extremely powerful roles in enabling current research to go more effective in enabling more open access to people who want crypto psychedelics or longevity therapies. I think fundamentally give the people what they want, right? Like, why do we have to live in a society where like, I can't do what I want? Like, like as long as I'm not hurting anyone and as long as I'm not posing any risks or harm other than potentially to myself, like I'm allowed to smoke and drink alcohol, which kills more people worldwide than like anything else. But like, no, I can't try this new experimental therapy or this, I, I can't eat this mushroom. Like that to me seems, that doesn't make any sense. And so I think network states have a really powerful, uh, yeah, a really powerful potential role to play, to play in that. Well, what's your opinion, Brian? Or any, any thoughts from you, Dima? I agree with you. I actually, and I, I think it's certainly has that role in psychedelics. We can have that role there. Although, you know, actually, I feel like psychedelics are maybe kind of threatening to governments, but not like as like, I think crypto is generally like viewed as like more, more threatening. And I, I think crypto maybe needs network states even more. I think especially if you think of things like privacy, right, which is something where I think there's like just a complete, you know, the governments may be like, okay, you can, you can, you can trade and speculate and stuff, but you know, we want to like know exactly what you're doing and like, we want to control the ins and outs and be able to shut things down. And if you're going to try to do something privacy focused, we're going to like, you know, like come after you. So I think that that feels like something where, you know, what's the way out there? I mean, one of the ways out I could see is if you do have more of these, like, uh, you know, new states that are saying, Hey, we actually want to sort of enshrine some of these, you know, rights of people, which I think historically some countries have done like a great job at, right? Like the U S of course, with the constitution has historically done, uh, you know, great job at like protecting people's rights of so Switzerland as well. Right. I think we're like privacy, something that's really like held up high. Uh, but I feel it's been kind of getting, um, with technological changes, it feels like these values kind of keep dropping away. And I feel there's some kind of need for like a rebirth, right? Where someone says, okay, we're going to come and, you know, define new rights and protections that people should enjoy that are actually like in many ways, similar to things that they were in the past, but just like updated for like the digital age and for the internet and for blockchains and decentralization. I really like that thinking and it actually just made me wonder like why are network states like why not put like constitutional level rights into like it's I guess it's hard to enforce through a smart contract but actually I've seen a lot of network state initiatives essentially become these like little mini pop-up conferences and I'm like that's cool but actually like why not start at a what should a constitution look like for a network state um, and I think then if you started combining it with actual like on both on-chain rights and potential off-chain rights, if such a network state actually had a piece of land or was in a physical location, I think that'd be really interesting. Um, I'm wondering, Brian, have you seen any experiments? Like, I, I know network states itself is almost is almost becoming an area, like in like a yeah a hot area in crypto. But I'm, I'm curious if you've seen. So you've seen anyone actually work at what you've described, like that constitution? Yeah, I'm not like super up to date uh, on like, you know, with the latest thing in network states. But, you know, for example, I did, we did do podcasts, it's been a while too now, but with, uh, you know, it's Project Nation 3. So that's basically uh, Louis Quende, who was one of oh, the yeah. co-founders of Aragon. And Aragon, of course, I think was one of the first kind of things where he was trying to do on-chain, like basically... To, trying to do DAOs and they had this idea also of like a court system 
And uh, and I think Nation 3 is really like, is trying to do that, right? I think that's one of the core things that trying to, to have is this kind of like, you know, on-chain legal system where then they can have, you know, different kinds of values and ways to dispute, uh, handle disputes. And so, yeah, at least that's one I'm aware of that's kind of going in this direction. Cool. Yeah, it's a good job with Lewis. I haven't seen him or I yeah, haven't seen him in a while. Cool. Anything else you guys want to touch on? Can I ask Dima, just a question from our community. Um, uh, what's your like favorite psychedelics out of like the many, the many that exist and, and why? It's hard to give one answer, right? Because everything is very context specific, right? And, uh, uh, depends on what's your perceived intention, right? Sometimes you feel isolated and alone and then taking MDMA is, can be amazing, right? Sometimes you want to deal with some difficult emotions, uh, and then let's say something like ketamine and 5-MeO can be very, uh, opening, uh, emotionally opening combination. Sometimes you want to meditate deeply or whatever, right? Like, so it's really about the context. It's hard to pick one. I, uh, 5-MeO, the DMT, right, is a very powerful tool that I've gotten to appreciate more and more. Uh, and it's really awesome that it's, uh, it's not criminalized in Canada. That's actually available in those mushroom stores there. And uh, so it's very powerful, right? So, of course, it's always uh, very important that people approach the things carefully and gently, right? That's kind of one of uh, the big things, as I always kind of like to say, that, you know, life will inevitably fuck your heart so why don't you be gentle with yourself and you know because difficult stuff will happen anyway right so gentleness is an important aspect of uh, how life is approached here now so yeah there is that but i mean 2cb i love 2cb i think it's awesome um, even though i haven't taken it in a long time and there are so many fun cool things to play with carefully uh you know responsibly <laughs> if you will and uh yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, Dima, first of all. Um, and I, I'm personally also really interested in 5-MEO uh, and think much more research should be should be funded so people actually know what use cases can I apply 5-MEO DMT for and like what is the, like what is some, what does the data say what people are experiencing? Um, <laughs> I mean, so when people <laughs> meet God, right? Like how the fuck do you measure that? <laughs> all right. <laughs> On a scale of one to ten, how much was, you know, how deeply did you meet God? <laughs> but yes, of course, human mind will find a way to try to measure stuff. Yeah, I was like, you know, 60% into <laughs> feeling like connecting with God. <laughs> Do you, and, and I actually have an interesting community question that might also be a nice way to round it off. Um, so... Do you think that people need to hang up the phone after they've gotten the message? Uh, this is, I think, something that is often discussed in psychedelics is like, uh, or do you think there's a wider way to frame this? I think that always, 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 the only thing that happens is the only thing that can happen, right? So then we try to find the story that describes and says, oh, I should have or I should not have, but that's bullshit because the only thing that happens is the thing that happens, right? And, uh, you know, if you have an experience and then sometimes you're tempted like, wow, you know what, I'll stay away from that for like, you know, next year at least. Like, you know, my first experience was 5 a.m. I'm like, wow, not going to touch it for a while. That was so powerful, right? Sometimes... It opens something and then you want to continue going there. Sometimes you like, oh, you know what? Like that was awesome. And now I just want to, I don't know, go to Vipassana and you know, Vipassana can be a very powerful experience too. So for me, there is no answer to that, right? Like we want to find the recipe, a recipe that will take us on the prescribed path from where we are and we are suffering and unhappy and not peaceful and we'll get to, and you know what? There is no such path, right? Like, you know, you only have this current moment and uh, the emotions of that and and your actions, right? So everything is uh, absolutely, totally unique and subjective to you. And everybody, anybody that tells you that tells you you should do this and you know, or you should not do this, 
And I, I always say, like, thank you, but, you know, fuck you. Like, because you've never lived this consciousness, right? You've never been in the shoes of this reality. You have no idea, right? So I don't believe in advice as such. You know, like, uh, we can throw ideas. But you know what? Most of the time, a human who is going through something difficult, I would much rather give them a hug. I would, you know, just, like, you know, hug them, give them a glass of tea or whatever. They don't need my fucking advice, you know, they will figure it out, right? But, you know, sometimes we feel disconnected and we feel lost and, you know, we feel unloved and all of that. And you know what? Let's share the love that we have. Cool. Beautiful. Well, I think that's a good place to maybe, like, end this conversation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With the instruction of, like, give someone a hug and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and people will figure out their own thing. I think that's generally true. Right on. Yeah, thanks, guys. That was uh, really cool to chat, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks, Timo. It was really great to have you on. Really enjoyed the conversation. It's a little bit of a different podcast than we generally do, but I think still kind of like a lot of connections to decentralization and I think all of the values that, you know, people sort of try to realize right, when working on these technologies or exploring uh, psychedelics. So thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much for having, having us.